It won't surprise anyone to hear that, in my opinion, Batman the Animated Series is the definitive take on Batman and his rogues gallery. I've dedicated hundreds of hours of my life, possibly even thousands now, <laughs> to making videos about the characters seen in that wonderful show. One of the things I really like about the show is the way they prioritise the psychology of the villains. These poor tortured souls were, in many cases, victims that struggled with their despair and lashed out at the world in response to it. They were often characters whose motivations you could understand but not exactly condone, and this made them sympathetic, except for the Joker of course. In the Batman comic books, there was a comic book that attempted to reframe the Joker in a slightly more sympathetic light, and that was Batman the Killing Joke by Alan Moore and Brian Bolland. This comic popularised the idea of one bad day being all it takes to tip someone over the edge into insanity. Now, the beauty of Moore's work is that, yes, you can interpret the Joker as a tragic figure, but at the same time he challenges this view by showing Commissioner Gordon overcoming his one bad day, and the Joker admits to being an unreliable narrator, so who's to say if the origin story he recalls is even true? Framing all this through the lens of Batman the Animated Series, I immediately thought of the wonderful villain-centric episode, Trial. Now the premise of Trial is pretty simple. The inmates have taken over the asylum and have kidnapped Batman and District Attorney Janet Van Dorn to put Batman on trial for the crime of creating them. Their argument is that Batman was involved in all of their one bad day that tipped them over the edge, and if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't be the way they are and he should be punished for it. The courtroom is filled with members of Batman's rogues gallery, with each of them fulfilling a role in the trial. I'm going to talk about each of them and how their one bad day wasn't really just one day, it was more of a bad life. Let's talk about the first villain we see in Arkham, the prosecution, Two-Face. Now, Two-Face is one of two villains who came to be partially because of Batman's actions, but only partially, mind you. We see in the episode Two-Face that Harvey Dent had a psychotic break and released his violent alternate personality Big Bad Half on Rupert Thorne and his men, who were trying to blackmail him. One of Thorne's men attempted to shoot Dent in the back. Batman barged him out of the way, saving Dent's life. However, in the process, an electrical box was shot, causing a live wire to fall into a nearby vat of chemicals, leading to the explosion that disfigured Dent. Upon seeing his new face for the first time, Big Bad Harv screamed in terror and mentally retreated, leaving a new personality to take control. Two-Face. So yeah, okay, I might see why you could argue that Batman created Two-Face, at least superficially. And yes, that was one particularly bad day for Harvey Dent. However, his mental health woes didn't appear out of nowhere. Harvey Dent had struggled with his anger in his childhood, and after defending himself from a school bully and thinking they had hospitalised him, he vowed to never let his anger control him again. And that's the root of his problem. His lifetime of suppressing his emotions and allowing them to fester. You could argue that the first bad day was the day that he punched the bully the day he decided to show restraint no matter the cost, and that is what led to the creation of Two-Face. I think Two-Face knows that. He doesn't explicitly ever say that he blames Batman for his predicament. He tries to tell the other villains that Batman is responsible for all of them, but that just simply isn't the case. The other villain whose origins involve Batman is the judge of the trial, the Joker. Now, I recently did a whole video about how Beatass's Joker is not a sympathetic figure. He was evil long before he fell into that vat of acid. If anything, the mania induced by his dunk in the toxic chemicals just removed his inhibitions and made him more open about being who he was. The Joker, operating under the name Jack Napier at the time, was a member of the Valestra crime family, and he was a committed criminal. He murdered Carl Beaumont, which set Andrea Beaumont on her own path of vengeance, for instance. But he was active long before Bruce Wayne discovered his true self and became Batman. Batman's role in the Joker's origin is less clear. A TV recreation of the night shows Batman punching Napier, leading to him falling into the vat of acid. When the Joker offers to recreate that night with reporter Jack Ryder, he simply pushes Ryder. And when the Joker tells his psychiatrist about what happened, he frames it as mean old Batman picking him up and throwing him into the acid. The truth is never revealed, but the fact that the Joker refers to his origins in at least two different ways suggests that he is an unreliable narrator. The point is, Jack Napier may very well consider the day he fell into that tank of acid as a bad day, but this was not responsible for him becoming a monster. Jack became the Joker because of choices he made. He chose to join the Valestra crime family. He chose to rob the Ace Chemical Plant. He chose to engage with Batman. And it's those choices that led to his physical change. 
he was already a monster long before his skin got bleached. Let's move on to the foreman of the court, the ventriloquist and Scarface. Now these are the only villains that don't really say whether they believe that Batman was to blame for their condition or not. However, the BTAS tie-in comic books elaborate that Arnold Wesker began to disassociate as a child after witnessing the murder of his mother, who was caught in a drive-by shooting. Wesker became meek in response to this, wanting nothing to do with his family's organised crime unit. But the mean and calculating side of him, the part of him that was born out of the trauma of losing his mother before his eyes, manifested itself in the form of a puppet modelled after Al Capone. Scarface. Batman didn't become aware of Wesker until he was much older, and Scarface had become the dominant personality. Batman would do all he could to try to rehabilitate Wesker, because he recognised him as a kindred spirit. Where Wesker retreated inside of himself, young Bruce Wayne went out and sought to improve himself to try to prevent anyone else from experiencing the same thing he had. Keep that in mind for later on. So let's talk about the other members of the jury. Up first we have the Scarecrow. Now Batman had absolutely nothing to do with Jonathan Crane's obsession with fear. As a university professor he specialised in the power of fear and he took his studies to unethical places, torturing his students for his own perverse delight. As a result of this abuse he was fired from his job, cutting off his access to young people to torment. In response to this he sought revenge on the dean of the university that had fired him. Crane didn't seek revenge out of despair or feelings of loss, he was enraged at his own impotence, his inability to hold on to that position that he clearly valued and abused. He was the owner of a chemical company with a massive factory and was able to produce his own supply of fear toxin, but that wasn't enough for him. He values intellect and being a professor was clearly important to him and his ego. Having his ego wounded was such a slight that he refused to accept it, and so he sought to destroy the university financially by burning their cash reserves. Note that he tells his dense henchmen that they can take some of the money if they want, but they need to destroy the rest of it because it's not about money, it's about revenge. Batman has minimal involvement in Scarecrow's origin. He simply foils his plan, outsmarts him and overpowers him. Batman is not responsible for the Scarecrow, and the Scarecrow was already a warped human being long before he got fired. Next up we have the Riddler. Now he's interesting because he appears in the background as a member of the jury, but then disappears from the episode afterwards. An in-universe explanation I quite like is that he saw the folly of putting Batman on trial and took the opportunity to escape from the asylum before everything inevitably fell apart. The Riddler's one bad day came when he had his position at Competitron taken away from him by the greedy executive Daniel Mockridge. Edward Nigma had programmed the highly successful Riddle of the Minotaur game for Competitron, but his work for hire contract prevented him from a share of the royalties. Nigma tried to sue, but was unsuccessful and was cast out of the company. Edward Nigma felt so angered and let down by the legal system and to a certain extent himself, that he decided to abandon his identity of Edward Nigma, attempting to erase all records of his existence and become the Riddler. Batman's only involvement in this is that he had the audacity to outsmart the Riddler at every turn. From the Riddler's perspective I'd say he had several bad days. The day he signed that contract with Competitron, the day he was fired and the day he lost the lawsuit. And the Riddler is aware of this, hence why he leaves. Next we have Harley Quinn, and oh boy where do I start with her. Dr Harleen Quinzel was the Joker's psychiatrist at Arkham, and the Joker manipulated her into believing that he was in love with her, turning her into his pawn. After an inappropriate display of emotion when the Joker returned to Arkham, brutalised by Batman, Harleen left the asylum and created a costumed identity of her own, Harley Quinn, and broke the Joker out of Arkham. Now Harley doesn't blame Batman for her situation in life, in fact she thanks him for creating the Joker. From her perspective, that day was not a bad day, but the best day of her life, as it forced her to abandon her normal dreary life and embrace insanity with the Joker. The fact is that Harleen Quinzel must have had problems to begin with. Mad Love, her origin story, was originally a comic book before it was adapted into an episode of the new Batman Adventures. In the comic book original, it is suggested that Harley only wanted to work at Arkham because she thought she could write a tell-all book about the patients, particularly the Joker, and earn herself a small fortune. However, the comic also shows that Harley wasn't exactly a gifted scholar, and instead used her feminine wiles to get better test results. This was scrapped from the TNBA episode, partially for time reasons I suspect, but also because it's kind of gross and not at all suitable for a kids show. But the point is, Harleen Quinzel did not have one bad day. She was someone that was trying to make the best of a mundane life, and she found herself completely out of depth when she tried to match wits with the Joker. 
The next jury member to look at is the Mad Hatter. During his testimony, he explicitly says that it was all Batman's fault that he became the Mad Hatter because Batman had tried to take Alice away from him. But that is not at all accurate. Jervis Tetch created the mind controlling tech because he was a meek mouse of a man. He wasn't able to achieve the things he wanted in life. He wanted fame, respect and love. But the only way he could get them was by taking control of people's minds. In his debut episode, Tetch says, I'll cut that cowl off your neck before you'll take her. I've waited my whole lonely life for her. And that single line is key. He didn't have just one bad day. His entire life was one bad day after another. At least that's how it felt to him because he spent his whole life thinking he deserved certain things, but never did anything to try to achieve those goals. So afraid was he of rejection that he wilted away and drove himself to controlling others, lamenting how loathsome his life was. When Janet Van Dorn suggests that Tetch could have respected Alice's wishes and left her alone, he explodes with rage saying he'd have killed her first. And that right there shows the kind of person he really is. Bitter, entitled, arrogant. On the opposite end of the spectrum we have the next juror, Poison Ivy. Pamela Isley felt she was on a righteous crusade to protect nature from humanity. Rather than sitting on her behind moaning about things, she took it upon herself to stand up and do something about it. It's just that her methods were completely wrong. She targeted Harvey Dent because his campaign to build Stonegate Prison caused the extinction of the wild Thorny Rose. Or should I say the near extinction because Isley managed to save a plant before the bulldozers cleared the way. Poison Ivy's backstory before this point is never elaborated on. While the mainline comic books touch upon the notion of Isley being taken advantage of and experimented on by her college professor Jason Woodrow, none of that comes up in the DCAU. If anything, it seems like Pamela experiments on herself to become more plant-like and less human. It was a choice likely spurred on by her disgust with her fellow man, not some tragic abuse story. She didn't have a singular bad day before becoming Poison Ivy. I mean, unless you want to count her witnessing the roses being bulldozed, I suppose. The Batman the Animated Series Writer's Bible introduced an idea about Pamela Isley being assaulted in a greenhouse before it burnt down. And this is vaguely hinted at in Pretty Poison based on her reaction to the fire in the greenhouse. Something tells me that this wasn't her first rodeo. But almost all of that material in the Writer's Bible either wasn't mentioned or was replaced with a better idea. This is the same document that describes Clayface as a thief that uses a special serum to change his face for 24 hours, and Killer Croc as a big game hunter that got bitten by a weird reptile and turned into a reptile man. But I digress. The point is, Ivy didn't have a bad day. She's bold, strong, and does what she thinks is right, no matter how hideous it might be. The final jury member to talk about is Killer Croc. He's the easiest one to speak about. Waylon Jones was born with a condition that made his skin hard and scaly, sort of like a crocodile. He claims to have worked in a circus sideshow where he suffered indignities because of his appearance. But the only thing we know for certain is that he was part of a wrestling promotion, working under the name Killer Croc Morgan. However, he also moonlit as a mob assassin and went to prison after being caught by Harvey Bullock. Croc argues that when you look the way that he does and people think you're a monster, you don't have much choice in acting like a monster. He's completely wrong though. As we saw in the episode Sideshow where the other circus performers were thoroughly decent people. Yes, he has had a hard life, but he didn't have to become a murderer. It's not just one bad day that defined him, it was his entire stinking life and the way he reacted to it. And Batman had minimal involvement in it. So it comes as no surprise then that the jury unanimously came to the conclusion that Batman didn't make them who they are. They're insane, not stupid. However, they're also cruel, warped people and they decide to punish Batman anyway. There's one other scene I'd like to talk about and that's Janet Van Dorn's remarks after Poison Ivy's testimony. She makes it clear that, sure, their appearances might change, but every single one of the villains would still be out there making other people's lives miserable if Batman wasn't around. If anything, people like them made Batman, not the other way around. And that's one of the central points of Batman the Animated Series version of Batman. I had a bad day too, once. His life was irrevocably changed after one bad day, but it didn't make him a monster. His parents decided to take a shortcut to their car down a dimly lit alleyway, and they were murdered by a desperate man trying to steal their belongings. Batman has no idea who killed his parents. He never gets closure in the show, and that's what compels him to keep fighting night after night. He's compensating for what he perceives to be his greatest failure, the inability to prevent his parents' murder. That one bad day 
changed the trajectory of his entire life. But Batman's response to that pain and suffering wasn't to lash out at the rest of the world, as many of the villains did. No. Instead, he decided that if he couldn't save his parents, he would do everything in his power to prevent the same thing from happening to someone else. And that doesn't just include putting on long pyjamas and punching criminals. He would dedicate his vast resources to trying to eradicate the main driver of crime in Gotham City. Poverty. As Bruce Wayne, he provided resources to the poor of the city. Free healthcare good paying jobs and the chance at rehabilitation for those that go down the wrong path. And as Batman, he would take on those that would refuse to get with the program, be that the corrupt businessmen in Gotham or the costume crazies. And that is how Batman the Animated Series ultimately rejected the idea of one bad day being all it takes to drive someone mad. Instead, they flipped the idea on its head. All it took to change the world was one man's bad day. Okay, that's it for this week's essay. If you like the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, tell all your friends about me. You know how YouTube works. If you really enjoyed the video and have the means, please consider making use of the thanks button to send a buck or two my way because every little helps. I offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essay, priority responses to your comments, members only videos, custom emojis, and an icon on your profile indicating that you're one of my people. And special thanks to my current channel members who are all listed on the screen right now. Next time I'm going to take a look at one of the final remaining heroes of Gotham City on my list. We're going to be talking about Batgirl, Barbara Gordon, and how, after a slow start, she became one of the most important people in all of Gotham City. Hope to see you then.